بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله مساءكم في كل مكان وأهلا ومرحبا بكم في باحة كلية الأداب الإلكترونية برعاية السيد رئيس جامعة الموصل الأستاذ الدكتور قصي كمال الدين الأحمدي المحترم وباشراف السيد عميد كليه الاداب الدكتور محمد علي محمد عبد المحترم مقيم كليه الاداب محاضره علميه باللغه الانجليزيه وهي محاضره الكترونيه يقدمها الدكتور محمود راكان احمد قسم اللغه الانجليزيه كليه التربيه العلوم الثانيه تدير الجلسه وتحاوره الست هدى عبد الله عبد اللطيف قسم اللغه الانجليزيه كليه الاداب وانا سادير الجلسه باذن الله تعالى الكترونيا من ناحيه الحضور ومن ناحيه المسائل الالكترونيه والفنيه الجلسة لذلك أنقل الآن المايك إلى الزميلة هدى عبد الله عبد اللطيف لتدير الجلسة. تفضلي دكتورة هدى. شكرا جزيلا دكتور عبد الله. شكرا جزيلا دكتور. أهلا وسهلا. Good evening everyone. Thank you دكتور عبد الله for presenting me. I'm هدى الحساني, a lecturer at University of Mosul College of Arts, Department of English. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this event. First of all, welcome to you our guest in this scientific lecture entitled An Introduction to the Peak Movement, held by our college through Media and Public Relations Division and presented by Dr. Mahmoud Rakan Ahmed, an instructor of English Literature at the University of Mosul College of Education for Humanities Department of English. Mr. Mahmoud got his BA in English Language from the Department of English College of Education, University of Mosul in 2006, while his MA in English Literature is from Philman University in Lebanon in 2013. As a scholar, Mr. Mahmoud has some published papers in different scientific journals like Adab Rafidain, Adab Adab al-Farahidi and al-Ustad journals. He taught many literary subjects too, like novel, drama, and short stories. Now, he is a lecturer of the Romantic and Victorian Poetry at the Department of English College of Education for Humanities. So, nice to have you with us today, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much. Before Thank you. Um, and before I'll give the floor to you, uh, I'd love to introduce your topic to our guest today. As you know, our guest, our lecture is about the peace movement. So what is the peace movement? In general, this movement, also called the generation, is an American social and literary movement originating in the 1950s and centered in the Bohemian artist communities of San Francisco's North Beach, Los Angeles's Venice West, and New York City's Greenwich Village. So, what are the reasons behind apparent of such movement? What aspect could it devise? Why? What in your consciousness do the peace create according to William Plate's terms and Walt Whiteman's poet? politics and how such a new consciousness can offer an alternative vision to regain white men's vision and version of America that represents America's basic ideals. And what are the America's basic ideals in the first place? All these questions and more will be answered by Dr. Mahmoud throughout his lecture. Now, the mic is yours, Dr. Mahmoud. Best of luck to you, and I wish you all the joy with his lecture, our guest. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Dear colleague, thank Welcome. you very much. Uh, Ms. Huda, and thanks thank a lot you. for my dear friend, Dr. Abdullah, for giving me this chance to present my paper about the beat generation. My paper falls into three parts. Part one, uh, at the beginning, I'm going to be 
uh, I'll be talking about the historical background of this movement, the factors that incited these writers to form uh, this uh, literary movement. Then I'll be talking about the genesis of the beat movement. Then I choose one of the most important or impressive uh, poems written in the American history, Howell by Ellen Ginsberg, which, uh, which reveals the uh, most important features of the beat uh, of the beat movement. Then I'll I'll be finishing my paper with the conclusion. Uh, after the end of the Second World War, two superpowers aspired to dominate and control the world: the United States of America and the Soviet Union. These two powers were engaged in a potentially lethal lethal struggle. They competed on political, economic, economic, and cultural levels in order to merchandise and export their propaganda, ideologies, and schemes. By the beginning of the 1950s, a cold war started, started between these two powerful nations based on their opposed ideologies and the resulting race to produce more powerful nuclear weapons. America, in this nuclear culture, was opulent, flourishing, and confident after its victory in the Second World War. However, America at this time, at that time, was retrogressive in its response to a perceived ideological and existential threat. Socialist critic Irving Ho described this period between inverted commas as the age of conformity. Historian Richard de Grey claims that in this confirmed environment, many liberal, cultural, and artistic figures believed that they could perform their, their critical functions, but they could not be involved in social and political crises. Therefore, I quote, many writers would draw from active involvement in issues of public concern into formalism, abstraction, and myth-making. End of quote. American policies had succeeded, according to Gray, in making American intellectual, intellectuals and artists tamed, moderate, and submissive. And they controlled them. Okay, as a rebuttal, rebuttal to this cultural mood of retreat and modesty, a literary movement arose to offer a substitutional vision in both its politics and aesthetics. Politically, the Beats offered an emancipatory new vision for the social order that embraced freedom, existentialism and Buddhism, along with the Dionysian values of ecstasy, hedonism, and disorder. These political values translated into literary works that established, that established literary aesthetics that broke with the dominant aesthetic values of the time, formalism, abstraction, and academic craft. To embrace instead a Whitmanesque aesthetics of spontaneity, honesty in vernacular language, prophetic vision, and a rational restoring what the poet Allen Ginsberg called, I quote, the human consciousness of unconditioned spirit. The genesis of the beat movement. At first, the beat movement was a small group of friends, including William Barrows, Jack Kerouac, and Allen Ginsberg. It later became a literary movement. This movement consisted of two camps. The Bohemian artists of San Francisco, which include Kenneth Rexroth, Peter Orlovsky, Michael McClure, and Laurus Ferlinghetti. And the New York camp, which included Neil Cassidy, Jack Kerouac, William Barros, and Anne In fact, it was Jack Kerouac who coined the term the Beat Generation. And I, I, I just want to explain something for you. Uh, the translation, yani I couldn't find the equivalent the translation for the word beat. Okay, so the best one was the Jilil Ahtijaj. Okay, so it has many connotations, many meanings. Okay, the beat. The word beat has multiple and complex connotations. In music, for example, it means keeping the beat, being in a groove or harmony with others. It also implies a jazz beat. In a social and psychological sense, it con it connotates the beating condition of the of the outsiders, who is down, perhaps, but certainly not out. Spiritually. Beat is related to beatitude, to happiness, and this describes blessedness and blackness and innocence. In poetry, it denotes to typewriter jazz aimed at catching the abrupt, syncopated rhythms, and improvisational lash and brova of jazz, b-pop, and swing. In his article entitled The 50s and After, An Ambiguous Culture, 
Frederick Karp explains that the word big had been used in jazzic circles after the Second World War. It means, I quote, down and out, or poor and or exhausted. Whereas Jack Kerouac insists on a mysterious spiritual inference in the manner of Battleby, Melville's nonconformist who intoned, I quote, I would prefer not to. It means I, I, yani, I object, uh, I gravel. Alan Ginsberg defined the beat as the exhausted at the bottom of the world, looking up or sleepless, wide-eyed, perceptive, rejected by society, on your own and street wise. The beat was the outsider who looked from the underground at the post-World War II American society, rejecting its ideals, principles, and values. Therefore, the beat writers in general, and Allen Ginsberg in particular, represent what, I, what I'll be calling a Dionysian, movement, a, Dion, a Dionysian movement in American cultural and literary history. Ginsberg's ecstatic voice and visionary influence arose from deep personal experiences, traumas, and the troubles that, when combined with a disruptive and visionary Blakean imagination, dissolved conventional political and aesthetic distinctions between the private and the public, the personal and the political. Ginsberg's poetry, therefore, particularly the works of the 50s and the following decades, represents a transcendental and a prophetic vision of America that counterbalanced the repression and oppression systematically practiced by the American administration at that time. As a theoretical framework, the Beats adopts Blake's idea of the poet prophet, not in the religious sense, in which the poet's, in the, in which the poet's role was not to predict threats to freedom, but to pronounce and actuate against them. And Whitman's notion of egalitarianism and democracy converts to an aesthetic and political legacy, legacy for the Beats. The Beats look to, the, to this legacy, look, sorry, the Beats took this legacy seriously by firstly confronting the prevailing political repression and conformity, and secondly, by casting the terms of this confrontation in poetics that communicated personal and autobiographical obsession in abashedly, in unabashedly public and political ways. The formalism and academic honesty of thought and expression in order to open a space of increased social freedom and the variety of subject positions. Ginsberg, in particular, employs these in new politics and, est and established more democratized aesthetics. The Beats established their own confessional aesthetics with importunity, importunity and sentiment in order to undermine repression, conservatism, conservatism and conformity. They perceived their fatigued and exhausted lives as the subject matter of their literary productions. Their gauntlet of cultural taboos their interest in sexual expressions and homosexuality, and their obsession with the drugs were necessary factors for the genesis of their new consciousness. Nakedness, a crucial subversion notion, subversive notion, was invented and applied in their works. Nakedness mean, meant putting the writer's ego on paper. Everything the writer knew should be written down. It expressed the beat's honesty and sincerity. The Beats of production contained their private lives and experiences. In this way, they mirrored the suffocation and repression of the 1950s American, American conservative and conformist ideologies. These suppressive ideals and hegemonic policies co-opt and betray American ideals of freedom, democracy, and openness. Therefore, nakedness was a subversive aesthetic that uncovered the oppression and suppression underlying American, America's policies and extreme ideals. Madness is another subversive aesthetic employed and applied by the Beats. It reflects the extent of American hegemonic and oppressive policies. The Beats reincarnate madness as a reaction against the insanity of, insanity of conservatism, nuclear weapons, materialism, and militarism. For instance, Jack Kerouac, Jack Kerouac's On the Road depicts the, the novel written by Jack Kerouac, depicts a personal search for meaning and relevance in post-World War II American of conformism, 
claustrophobic Cold War strategies and McCarthyism. The Beats were a cowards supreme against spiritless and materialist America in the 1950s. In fact, the themes and subjects discussed in the, on the, in the novel On the Road and in Ginsberg's Howell are metaphorically considered the surrogate, the substitute manifestos of the Beats. The Beats rely on their new alternative vision on different notions and perspectives. perspectives. They embrace Buddhism, which offers them new teachings and ideals. The Beats employ and adopt Buddhist notion in order notions in order to foster their vision. Kerouac's Dharma Bombs, another, another novel written by Kerouac, Dharma Bombs, is an introduction to Buddhism. It is an invitation to repressed and suffocated Americans, Americans to embrace Buddhist ideals and challenge the conformist and materialist, ide materialist ideals of the 1950s America. Buddhism teaches the Beats to understand the world as a classless, free, and liberated. It also has uh, policies in media, politics, and social issues. The novel dramatizes Kerouac's relationship. Interruption. In, this, in his introduction to Howell, William Carlos That's Williams, right. yeah, writes, I quote, readers who were about to read Howell were going to enter the author's hell. End of quote. Howell is a single is a single poem, but is divided into four segments. The first segment comes as a catalog of the runes wrought upon the best mind and their durability against the conservative American culture. In the second segment, the poet chants against Moloch, the American culture embodied as a pagan god to whom children were sacrificed. The third part of the poem assures the coalescence of the poet with the mad, in particular with Carol Solomon, to whom the poem was first dedicated and gestures towards a hopeful reconciliation. Hope also brings and echoes throughout the footnote, a litany that begins with the word holy, which is repeated 15 times, asserting the sacred nature of all life, redeeming madness with divinity. The poetic voice in the poem echoes biblical prophets and aspects of its structure evoke various Hebrew prayers, Hebrew prayers. Ginsberg's prophetic voice accompanied with themes decidedly at odds with the dominant conservat conservatism in social, political, and cultural matters forms a powerful indictment of the insularity of the Cold War era. And I'd like just to show you the poem and just read some if you allow to me. Okay? I'll be sh uh, sharing the screen with you. Uh, it will be our pleasure. Thank you very much. Did you see the poem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, still, yeah, yeah. Now yeah. it's clear. Yeah. yeah. So look, this is the first part for Carol. The poem is dedicated for Carol Solomon. Uh, I'll just be reading some lines. For example, yeah, some lines. I saw the best mind of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at at dawn, looking for angry things. Fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavy lake connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night. Who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of Cold War, flags floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. Who bear their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenements, roofs illuminated. So this is the first part. Look, okay? and then the second and the third and the fourth parts. Mind is shapely. This note leads us to investigate how Howell is committed to, as Richard claim, as Richard Gray claims, the discontinuities of consciousness. Ginsberg was hugely influenced by the French painter Paul Cézanne. Ginsberg saw Cézanne as a big secret mystic. Paul Portuguese in his article, and
on successfully allows the practitioner to achieve high consciousness or as he calls it lord mind with capital l and capital m and the quote in fact portuguese explains that this idea is derived from Cezanne's letter to bernard in 1904 in his letter in this letter Cezanne defined the process of writing as you observe your own mind during the time of composition and write down whatever goes through the thicker tape of mentality or, or, or whatever you hear in the echo of your inner air or what flashes in picture or in the eyeball while you are writing in the court. According to Cezanne, practicing such a kind of writing entails the awareness of the actual process of mind. The artist who follows such formula hopes to achieve a penetration in common, in common perception by, by paying attention to his forms of consciousness. The impact Cezanne left upon Gillespie inspired him to write a poem which is dedicated to Cezanne. It is Cezanne's Sports, the title of the poem. In the foreground, we see time and life. Uh, this is a, a, some lines from the poem. In the foreground, we see time and life swept in rays toward the left-hand side of the picture, where shores meet shore, but that meeting place is interpresented. It doesn't occur on the canvas, for the other side of the bay is heaven and eternity, with a bleak white haze over its mountains, and the immersed water of La Estique is a go-between. For minute robots, end the poem. In fact, there is a parallel comparison between Cezanne's model in painting and Guinnessville's composition of poetry, specifically in his masterpiece, Howell. In order to paint his emotion on the canvas, Cezanne explains his role, I quote, an artist is only, is only a, recept, uh, a receptacle of source sensation, a brain, a recording device. Down to it, a good machine, but a fragile and complex, and complex especially what others are concerned, end of, uh, end of quote. The artist for Cezanne is a recording instrument who translates his sensation onto, onto the canvas. In parallel to Cezanne's method, Portuguese claims that Gillespie follows the same track in which the poet takes Cezanne's legacy seriously and devises a new form of formulating poetry. It is the spontaneous method of composition. It is derived directly from Cezanne. And Portuguese, in this sense, claims, I quote, this is precisely Guinness's theory of composition, in which art consists in paying attention to the actual movie of the mind. Like Cezanne, Guinness insists that he not be distracted, that his attention always be focused Self-consciousness is the great nemesis of this approach indeed. Rational thinking itself is a block because it gets in the way of a pure perception." End of quote. Both Kerouac and Guinnessberg developed this kind of writing, whose raw material is the literal workings of the mind. The Cezanne inspired the style in which Guinnessberg wrote Howell enabled him and his readers to find out eternity, as Guinnessberg writes. Not on canvas, but where? on paper. From Cezanne also, Gillesberg adopted and applied the idea of juxtaposition, which means the process of putting one color against another that supplies visual structure. Gray added that, and I quote, this has given him, he means Gillesberg, the idea of juxtaposition, of juxta, juxtaposing one word against another so that a gap between the two words is created, like the space gap in the canvas which the mind can fill in with the sensation of existence, end of quote. There are many examples of this idea in the poem. In the poem. On the, uh, one of these examples is hydrogen jukebox. I'm going to just read the line of this juxtaposition.
who sank all night in the submarine light of big force floated out and sat through the stale bare afternoon in desolate fugazis listening to the crack of doom on the hydrogen jukebox hydrogen jukebox okay on the one of these examples is hydrogen jukebox he combines unmatched words side by side hydrogen which has which suggests this both hydrogen bomb and a certain form of politics. And the jukebox was suggested jazz, jazz and music, popular music in general. And by implication, popular culture itself. He amalgamates these two words in a surprising conjunction in order to access different parts of the mind. And to create, and to create a temporary of suspicion of habitual thought. In fact, such a method as Portuguese claims would allow the poet and reader to would allow the poet and the, and the reader to experience the Buddhist sunyata. I mean, I meant again, if you place two images, two visual images side by side, and let the mind connect them, the gap between the two images, the lightning in the mind illuminates. In this sunyata. The poet traps the, uh, the archangel of the soul between two visual images to create a gap in consciousness that results in sunyata. The Buddhist equivalent of Sizan, Peter, and the poet in Satyana Dios. Sunyata is a Buddhist term which means the absence of rational, controlled mind, intuitive knowledge. Sunyata refers to the state of a pure mind, the same condition in which Sizan commanded for his art, that is, painting without distraction and absolute absor uh, absorption in the working of perception. Portuguese explained that the meditator, like the artist or, the, or poet of Ginsberg's conception, trains his mind to watch and record various processes of thought without conscious manipulation. When he is successful, flashes of eternal consciousness result. The result of Ginsberg's uh, uh, synthesis of hydrogen and jukebox is to create an association that stops mind in a flux, restrains normal consciousness, and it creates a synchronous void, which means sunyata according to Buddhist teachings. Sunyata then is equivalent to what John Keats called the negative capability, which according to Raskin is, to Joanna Raskin, I quote, the strength of mind to hold opposites, contradictory thoughts, without an irritable reaching after factor reason. Ginsberg transforms Sedan's technique of juxtaposition from painting to poetry and incorporates the Buddhist formula of sunyata in order to stun Americans concerning the tragic and dreadful consequences which the atom bomb left on him and his generation. He uses this technique in order to castigate American policies since they become destructive and hegemonic. Hydrogen jukebox links the hydrogen bomb and the jukebox to make an, in, an infernal machine that seems perfect for an age of mechanization and mass destruction. It is the fallout of the at atomic age which stimulates Guinnessburg to combine music and politics, two different and opposite spheres which cannot be reconciled except in America, where the global disasters disaster seem, seemed imminent. Uh, imminent sorry. The nuclear weapons increase terror and fear between the beings, who see themselves as the angel of Holocaust, angels of Holocaust. In this respect, Raskin writes, I quote, the awful consummation of this Holocaust of hysterical irresponsibility is the atom bomb. Guinnessburg I end the quote. Guinnessburg demands a clear world, a clear, a clear world without panic, destruction, and bombs. This wish stimulates him as a poet, prophet, to invent a new poetic style in order to reveal the tragic and horrific consequences of nuclear weapons. Guinnessburg sees America in the 1950s as a land of awe and terror. But despite all the atrocities and calamities Guinnessburg witnessed, he still had the hope and courage to subvert the political hegemony of an institutional authority by using his own aesthetic and text. Guinnessburg, in this, uh, Raskin, in this sense, uh, explains, I quote, Guinnessburg, 
argue with that. There were signs of hope in the midst of this, the destruction. All our healthiest citizens are at this moment turning into hipsters, hopheads, and poets in the court. He is healthy since he is a poet whose howl rejects the vulgarization and the inhumanity of modern America. According to Richard the Great, Ginsburg perceives himself as a prophet whose job is to prophesize for America. He is also sacred, blessed, and chosen. Add to that, Ginsburg's duty entails also the breaking of everybody's rules and baskets. He supports prophets in a bleak sense of the term and speaks about the risks and perils which threaten America, which threaten America. Moloch, in Ginsburg's eye, is the new god in modern America. It is the god to whom all correct values have been sacrificed. So American culture is left only with capitalism, mammon, industrialism, conformism, destructive technology, and atomic weapons. And here, allow me just to read a few lines about Moloch from Ginsburg's Howe. What's phoenix of cement and aluminium bashed upon their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ashkins, and unobtainable dollars, children screaming under the stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men weeping in the parks. Moloch, Moloch, nightmare of Moloch. Moloch, the loveless, mental. Moloch, Moloch, the heavy judger of men. Moloch, the incomprehensible prison. Moloch, the crossbone, soulless jailhouse and congress of sorrows. Moloch, whose buildings are judgment. Moloch, the vast stone of war. Moloch, the stunned governments. Moloch, whose mind is a pure machinery. Moloch, whose blood is running money. Moloch, whose fingers are ten armies. Moloch, whose breast is a cannibal dynamo. Moloch, whose air is a smoking tomb. I think this is enough. So, therefore, he howls against Moloch, which is manifested in contemporary America in order to reveal the real faces of Moloch, which then America's soul was corporatized and atomic. Everywhere, I quote, are lack, love, and cold war. People in horrible, grotesque masks, grotesque because hiding the knowledge from each other. That is Guinnessberg's first point, accounting for his germates against Moloch, that is the contemporary America at the court. This bus, Moloch, is manifested in Howell in armies, banks, government, prisons, and mental asylums. Moloch is the spiritless and conformist version of 1950s America, which is in direct contrast to Whitman's spiritual and democratic vision. Relying upon the notion of what he terms the unconditioned spirit, Ginsberg proposes to liberate his spirit in Howell, which is repressed in America, as he writes. I quote, the soul is innocent and immortal. It should never die ungodly in an armed madhouse, end of quote. In this context, Gregory Stephenson writes, I quote, each human soul inhabits the defensive, fearful, armed madhouse of the ego personality. The social self and the American nation has also become an armed madhouse, end of quote. For Gensler, the destruction of the ego depends on the idea of nakedness, which the beats innovate and apply. Therefore, nakedness, in the literary sense, destroys, uh, this, in this sense, destroys his ego, since it requires the process of, of pouring it out wholly and honestly on papers. Guinnessberg finds his spirit is imprisoned by his ego, which is affected by modern aspects of American society. And um, parallel to this, to his ego present, Gillesberg, as a poet prophet, sees America is also imprisoned by Moloch. Moloch's ego is manifested in conformity, militarism, commercialism, materialism, and consumerism. Thus, he employs the dictum of the personal and the private, is the public and the political, in order to overcome Moloch's ego, which suppresses, in this sense, both Gillesberg's spirit 
and Americas. I quote, Monaco's love is endless oil. This is from the poem. Monaco's love is endless oil and stone. Monaco's soul is electricity and bounce. Monaco's poverty is the specter of genius. Monaco's fate is a cloud of sexless hydrogen. Monaco's name is the mind. End of quote. As a poet prophet, Ginsberg finds a solution to this repression as he says, I quote, imaginary walls collapse. Oh, victory, forget your underwear. We are free. And, and quote. It is the crumbling of the imaginary walls, which are the new aspects of the modern American society. Ginsberg, as a modern poet prophet, sees in the beat literary aesthetics destructive weapons which have the potentiality and ability to destroy conformism, materialism, and militarism. In this sense, Joanna Raskin claims that, I quote, Naomi clashed head on with modern mechanical scientific robot governments. Moloch murdered Naomi with madness, and Moloch would murder him with madness, to unless he could slay the monster with the sword of poetry, end of quote. Naomi is the name of Ginsberg's mother. How will assess Ginsberg's personality and identity since it presents him as an angel headed sister who is persecuted by the authority and restricted by traditional social norms? How will subvert the hegemonic authoritative policies and restrictions and the existing sexual mores? It emancipates Ginsberg's self whose destination is eternity. How will subvert psychological wars? social obstacles and political barriers which were instituted between Americans. It is a human supreme against all kinds of tyranny, repression, and imperialism represented in hegemonic, hegemonic American establishments. Therefore, it was received it was received when first spreading in Gallery 6 in San Francisco as a fireball that went all forms of extremism, narrowness, and conservatism. In this sense, the San Francisco poet Michael McClure said after reading Howell that, I quote, a barrier had, had been broken, that a human voice and body had been hurled against the harsh walls of America, and supporting armies and, and navies and academies and institutions and ownership system and for support bases, end of quote. Howell is a soft power which Ginsberg employs to change, to change culture from within. It is the underground culture that lives on the margins and wishes to subvert all kinds of terrors, hegemony, despotism, and bullying. How for Ginsberg is a remarkable poem which carries sublime values. In this context, he writes, I quote, in publishing Howell, I was curious to leave behind after my generation an emotional time bomb that would continue exploding in U.S. consciousness in case our military industrial nationalist complex solidified into a repressive policy bureaucracy. End of quote. It is the breakthrough that breaks break through that breaks down traditions, conformism, and oppression, and immortalizes its structure. Now I'm going to read the last part of my paper. Conclusion. The beads emerged from the midst of atomic culture, oppression, conformity, and consumption in order to form an alternative vision which embraces egalitarianism, emancipation, and freedom. In this sense, their art is flavored with Nietzschean ideals, such as, I quote, I quote, art as the only superior counterforce to all will to denial of life as that which is anti-Christian, anti-Buddhist, and denialist for excellence. Do you hear me? There are as a powerful weapon against all kinds of tyranny.
Well, I think the net is interrupted again. Dr. Mahmoud? Yeah, yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now it's clear. Shall I continue? The new consciousness that the BC created has succeeded in inspiring Americans of the next generation to reject, to reject all kinds of suffocation, restrictions, and discrimination. In this context, Matt Yodo claims, I quote, as distances from the 1950s, in the Greece and the 1960s counterculture, bore fruit with solid social developments in the 70s and beyond. Many social critics overhauled earlier this uh, dismissal of the beat's significance. It is now clear that the beat heralded a refreshing new age of social and industry freedoms that was taken up by next generation of writers and activists. End of quote. The beat ignited Americans to restore Whitman's version of America, in which all Americans are free, democratic, and equal. The Beats invented the new aesthetics to subvert hegemony, intolerance, repression, and conformism. Uh, I, I quote from Ferenditis' poem, I am, waiting, I am waiting for a way to be divided, to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. End of quote. The Beats now new tool in this sense is the word. I quote, in the beginning, this is a quote from the Bible, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, in the court. It is the beat soft subver and subversive power which creates a new and enlightened visionary consciousness and demolishes conformism, materialism, and the mechanical consciousness in the 1950s America. I'm done now. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Dr. Mahmoud, for this wonderful lecture. Now, I return to you, our guest, if you have any questions to be answered by Dr. Mahmoud. Any questions? Is there any questions from our guests? Yes, Mr. Huda. Yes, Mr. Bode, I have a question for Mr. Mahmoud, if you allow me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Yes. Thank yeah. you very much, Mr. Mahmoud, for presenting this noteworthy lecture derived from the American literature. In fact, I have two questions that I want to ask you. The first question is that when T.S. Eliot and Ezra Bound had declared their ideas on the modern age of literature, their ideas received a general acceptance from the American intellectuals. So, what was the first reaction of the American intellectuals towards the ideas of the Beat Generation? Yes. This is my first question. Yes. Yeah. Yes, what about the second one? Uh, the second one, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, I don't think you can uh, answer the first question for him and then he okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed. Okay. The beats were rejected at that time by the mainstream culture. They accused them, uh, they charged them with madness as anti American. They want to destroy American values, American society. By the way, you know the name of the new vaccine that the Russian has invented is called, is entitled the Sputnik V. At that time, when the Russians first, uh, when, the, when the Russians uh, launched the first satellite to the space, it was called the Sputnik. The NIK suffixes was taken from this word and added to the beat. They called them beatnik. They make a, a, a comparison between these, these two powers, the, the Russian powers and the Beats. Say so they, the Beats, are just like the Russians or the Soviet Union's power. They want to destroy America, to, 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 to make everything, to, to devalue, uh, to, to destroy the values of the American society and to destroy America and American culture. 
culture. So they were rejected by the, by the dominant culture, by the mainstream culture, and refused from the academia. Okay? They received static uh, criticism and were rejected by the, the, the mainstream culture. They not, they, I mean, their ideas and aesthetics were not welcomed at that time. They were considered as mad, eccentric. Mr. Ahmed, is it clear? Is that clear, Mr. Ahmed? Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Ahmed, are you here with us? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mahmoud. Yeah, because Mr. Ahmed added to that, added to that, the raw material yeah. of their of their of their writings were their personal lives. Personal life. And in their personal life, yani, yani, they were yani, yani, to the extreme. They were addic uh, yani, addicted. Uh, they, didn't, um, uh, yani, they didn't like the social norms at that, that time because most of them were homosexuals. So they were reduced at that time because of these reasons. What about the second one? Yes, Mr. Mahmoud, you mean that the American intellectuals refused the B generation writers yeah. for their obscenity? Yeah. yeah. And this is what you mentioned in the in the poem yeah, of yeah. of James Baird, yeah. the Howl. For example, on the it, first publication, Mr. Yeah. Ahmed, Mr. Ahmed, they call it obscenity, but they reveal their their honesty, sincerity. What happened to them in their real life? They just rejected it, rejected it in lecture. Yeah, Mr. Mahmoud, you mean that there is a relationship between the death of the author and their ideas in their works? No, no, no. I, I, I disagree with this. They reveal their personal lives, personal experiences, their traumas and their struggles, what they were suffering from, okay, reveal it, reflected it in their, in their writings, in their literature. That's why they were rejected. And I think it was, يعني, يعني, this was يعني, not correct. When you read the yani, the deep writings and their poems and novels, yani, I'm sure you'll like it. But Mr. Mahmoud, Kerouac, for example, he has a prominent novel which is entitled On the Road, and you had yeah. mentioned it. Yeah. In On the Road, it reveals the behavior of these characters. And the characters reflect the writers themselves. This is yeah. why this novel is called Simi Ot. Mr. Ahmed? Mr. Ahmed, are you here? It is the, the internet again. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Mr. Ahmed? Okay, um, is there anyone else have uh, may have any questions? Yes, yes, Miss, Mrs. Yeah. Dr. Huda, yeah. Dr. Huda, yeah, yeah. good evening yeah. for everybody. I am Zainab Abdel Latif from uh, Ministry, Ministry of Culture, Al Mamun House for Translation and Publishing. Welcome to you here in uh, our lecture today. Yes, I would like, yes, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Rakan. Yes, I appreciate your effort about your uh, this study, and really, uh, it is a distinguished project, and we need this kind of a project, uh, and we need this kind of movement in Iraq. I think we have writers and poets like Walt Whitman uh, in Iraq. So I appreciate very much with uh, your effort. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tarzana. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else may have any question for Dr. Mahmoud? I think there's a problem for all of us uh, in the internet, so we will just wait.
Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Huda. If can I can ask my second question. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Go Mr. Mahmoud. Uh, the beat writers found inspiration in a variety of sources, including the work of the 19th century American poet Walt Whitman, as yeah. you have mentioned. Yes. They looked yes. to Whitman's leaves of grass for yes. both form and content. When, yes. when a poet is inspired by another poet, he is called his disciple, right? How did how did the B generation yeah. were influenced by Walt Whitman in form and content? Thank you, Mr. Ahmed, for this. I think a very good question. Okay. And I'll be answer now, I'll be answering your question. Okay. The Beats consider Walt Whitman as their father, their god, their idea, source of imagination. They were especially fascinated by his notion of egalitarianism, which inspired ethical Whitman's conception of spiritual democracy, claimed that Whitman's notion of spiritual democracy was governed by two principles, Mr. Ahmed. One of them, the unlimited individuals. The other is the equality of individuals. The first principle can clearly be seen in Whitman's Lips of the Grass when he writes, I quote, I pass death with the dying and birth, birth with the new washed baby, and I'm not contained between my head and boots in the court, past, the present, and the future. His character recognizes no barriers. He's everything and speaks for everything. As for the equal, equality of individuals, Whitman, fly, Whitman writes, I quote, in all people I see myself, none more and not one, a barely con less, and the good or bad I say of myself, I say of them, end of quote. He sees all people as equal in his own eyes, regardless of their social status and rights. He sees them, Whitman, as equals because he's a poet who knows that equality exists only in a world of unlimited personalities. Okay, Mr. Ahmed? Yes, how are you? Is it clear now? Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Ahmed, for clarifying my question. Mr. Huda. Any questions? Any other questions for Dr. Mahmoud for this lecture? Well, I think we have no questions. Mr. Ahmed? Sorry, is that Mr. Huda? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, yeah. Mr. Huda, let me read, you, read just something for you. Yeah. From Mr. Ahmed, on the road. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud okay. wants to read something. This is for Mr. Ahmed. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Ahmed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Brennan. Look what he writes in On the Road. Okay? And look at this uh, subjective aesthetic uh, uh, to in, in his novel. I quote, the only people for me are the mad ones. Those who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And in the middle, you see the blue center light pop and everybody goes, oh, at the port. You see, Mr. Ahmed? Yes. How he employs not just his personal life, but even the technique of of madness as, a sub, as an aesthetic, subversive aesthetic in his writings. Yes, Mr. Mahmoud. Yeah. The B generation were influenced by Walt Whitman. They yes. are considered as their followers. Yes. And when someone is influenced yes. by someone else, he is named his disciple. This term, disciple, yes, yes. means someone 
you yeah. talk the same idea yeah. Cycle, yeah. from someone else. Yeah. yeah. And Walt Whitman yes. is a giant in the American literature. And as you know, the American literature yeah. is in you, in form and in content compared with the English literature. This is why the American writers yeah. try to praise their words. And this is yeah. what happened with the B generation. Honestly speaking, we had a course about the B generation in the MA, introduced by Dr. Wafa. But now my ideas were horizoned by your lecture, Mr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, here, Dr. Mahmoud. You know, Mr. Ahmed, they, some... they were even aspired. Yani, sorry, Dr. Huda. They were aspired by, yeah, yeah. by, by his ideas and ideals about democracy. You know, yani, yeah. to talk about or discuss the uh, democracy and to, yeah, to say, to claim that they are, to, to raise the slogan of democracy and no uh, social classes, uh, no so, uh, racial discrimination at that time. Yani, it was yani, even, even him, yani, even Walt Whitman, uh, yani, he was accused of being mad. Okay, yeah. so, um, and in this day, Dr. Fong, he called, uh, I think, the supermarket in, in California, he called uh, Whitman as old father. Yes. Well, by the way, Mr. Mahmoud, the subject of the B generation is very broad, and they have also yeah. roots in politics, for example, concerning the Cold War, and you have mentioned this between the Soviet Union and the American, the conflict that yeah. existed after the Second yeah. World War. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Hoda, Mr. Mahmoud, he is my colleague. I have been teaching with him since 2015 at the Department of English, College of Education for Humanities, and he is one of my close, closest friends. God bless you and bless him, Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, uh, thank you. For actually, that was uh, a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Um, actually, it has been so great to have you here with us today in this scientific gathering. God bless you. And we wish you Thank all you. the best in your future research and studies. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hoda. Uh, and to also, we have um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hassan, and we have Mr. Riyadh, uh, Mrs. Zainab, and Mr. Spood, all of them are thanking you, Mr. and uh, Dr. Mahmoud, for this lecture, uh, and wishing you, wishing you the, uh, the, all the best in your life. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. you very much for you. For, for, uh, for my, my friend, Dr. Abdullah, who gave me this chance. شكرا جزيلا دكتور محمود شكرا جزيلا ترى هدى واشكر استاذ الحضور على الحضور وطبعا اشكر دكتور احمد واعتقد اني ساقوم بعمل مناظره بين دكتور احمد ومحمود راكب يا اند مستر مستر احمد يا ات واز امين ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ثانك يو فيري ماتش شكرا جزيلا للحضور الكرام ثانك يو فيري ماتش اشكر الدكتور محمود على هذه المحاضره القيمه وان شاء الله لنا لقاءات اخرى I, I, I want to, uh, to thank all of you. Uh, before I'll give the floor to Dr. Abdallah, I want to thank all of you, our guests, for your attending and effective participation challenging the lockdown and the bad extraordinary circumstances represented by COVID-19 pandemic. God bless you all. Dr. Abdallah, I think the, the, the beginning and the end uh, uh, all the time is uh, with you. Yani, uh, Dr. Abdullah, I think it's time to be in the morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah. I'm going to be in the end of this presentation that the Dr. Mahmoud Rakan has been in the name of the English language, the English language, and the Dr. Abdullah Abdullah. Thank you very much for this presentation and thank you for this presentation and thank you for this presentation. على حضورهم هذه المحاضرة وعلى إفادتنا أيضا بالتعليقات والأسئلة التي كانت لها كان لها دور مهم في توجيه المحاضرة وإن شاء الله تعالى لنا لقاءات أخرى مع أيضا مع دكتور محمود والصور إن شاء الله سيكون لنا مناظرة بين دكتور محمود ودكتور أحمد في المستقبل إن شاء الله تعالى قد نعمل على ذلك
وفي الختام حب ان اوجه الشكر الى السيد رئيس جامعه الموصل لرعايه هذه المحاضره والى السيد عميد كليه الاداب والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام شكرا دكتور. وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. نلتقي على خير ان شاء الله.